The next item of business is a member's business debate on motion 2346 in the name of Maurice Corrie on the 100th anniversary of Erskine. This debate will be concluded without any questions being put. I would ask those members who wish to speak in the debate to press, press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on Maurice Corrie to open the debate around about seven minutes, please, Mr Corrie. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. It is indeed a privilege to begin this member's business uh, debate today, celebrating the 100th anniversary of Erskine. And I'd like to thank all members who supported the motion in my name, uh, which has allowed this debate to take place today. And I'm also delighted today to welcome all the members from Erskine, uh, both the uh, residents and service users who are here present in the, uh, in the public gallery. And I'm sure I can speak for the whole Parliament when I welcome them to Parliament and thank them for their service to our country. Erskine is often spoken about throughout the armed forces with great passion, gratefulness and held in the highest esteem. During the First World War, so great were the numbers coming home, from wounded, home wounded from the trenches of the Western Front that the existing contemporary medical facilities were struggling to cope with the demand. Stretched to breaking point, not only by the sheer quantity of men arriving from the battlefields of Belgium and France, but also by the complexity of the wounds and the injuries these men had sustained in the world's first industrial war. It was decided that a hospital dedicated to the wounded would be required. So Erskine came to be. Founded by Sir William McEwan, the Regis Professor of Surgery at the University of Glasgow, under the name the Princess Louise Scottish Hospital for Limbless Sailors and Soldiers. The hospital, opening its doors in October of 1916, with the official opening of the hospital taking place on the 6th of June 1917, at which the hospital's first patron, Princess Louise, made an appearance. What was then called Erskine House was chosen for the site after Thomas Aikman, the owner, offered free use of his mansion and gardens for the period of the war and for 12 years after it was declared over. Although Erskine Hospital remained at this site after that period due to the generosity of Sir John Reed, who bought the house and gardens and gifted it to charity. The Scottish public also showed their generosity towards our service personnel and veterans, a trait that survives to this day by donating the generous sum of £100,000 towards the founding of the hospital, a total of which today's money would be valued somewhere near £6 million. As their name suggests, at first, the Erskine Hospital mainly dealt with those who lost limbs in the service of their country. But Great Britain was solely reliant on artificial limbs from overseas, a situation which uh, Sir William McEwan found intolerable. So working alongside a local shipbuilding company called Yarrow Shipbuilders based in Scotston, who not only lent their yard, but also chose to, the, uh, to have some of their finest craftsmen working in the design and construction of artificial limbs. Sir William and Yarrow's began to design and construct a new concept artificial limb known as the Erskine artificial limb. And I am very fortunate enough to have actually been employed by Yarrow Group in the 1980s, and I can tell you that their conceptual skills uh, to this day are continued uh, in many ways and, uh, and areas of work. By December 1917, the hospital was, had treated 1,613 patients, and of those they treated, 1,126 required a new limb. And by 1920, there had been 9,500 artificial limbs fitted at the hospital, most of which were manufactured at the hospital's own workshops. Of course, the needs of service and veterans community in Scotland have changed since the First World War, and Erskine has changed to meet their needs. Erskine has gone on to care for over 85,000 veterans at their facilities across Scotland, and as I note in my motion, it is recognised that Erskine is considered as one of Scotland's, if not the world's, foremost providers of care for veterans and their spouses. Erskine now provides services across a number of facilities in Scotland, although not at the original Erskine House site, which was sold to fund the modernisation of the charity and is now very, a very well-regarded hotel. These new sites include the Erskine Home, which the charity moved into two purpose-built two purpose sites in the town of Erskine. 
opened in 2000 by the charity's current patron, Prince Charles, Duke of Rossi, the new flagship building directly replaced the original hospital uh, building, costing £16 million. The building provides nursing and dementia care on a long-term and respite basis to veterans. It has 180 beds available and is the biggest unit uh, the charity has. Also situated in Erskine itself is the Erskine Mains Home, which was opened in 2001 by the Princess Royal with 34 beds in this unit and is able to provide nursing and dementia care on a 24-hour basis. And I do commend to members of, the, of this chamber a visit to Erskine, and I have to go there from time to time. Um, I'm very welcome to go there to visit various veterans, and I can tell you it's an experience which I do relish, uh, and it's marvellous to see how they continue to allow veterans who have many, several disabilities, maybe just simply anno domini, uh, but they continue on a, a normal life as possible, and the staff give the most wonderful care that you could ever imagine. Uh, also, you get met with music in the, in the reception area. You're then transferred down a passageway past all sorts of pictures and memorabilia, which the residents themselves have put together, uh, some they brought from their own homes, but also recreating a shopping mall. And that is to give them the feeling that they're at home, they're actually getting normal life, and it includes even a cafe and a fish and chips. So I do recommend the fish and <laughs> chips uh, uh, members to you. Um, the Erskine Ho Park home itself was opened in 2006 by the Princess Royal and offers care for 40,000, sorry, 40,000, 4,000, sorry, 40 residents, I beg your pardon, <laughs> and specialises in dementia care. Um, I do visit this regularly because I have a brother-in-law who's been in there for three years uh, suffering from Pick's disease, uh, who was a serviceman in the Middle East. Um, and I must say the care he does receive is absolutely excellent. Um, and I've also been involved where I've actually had to help uh, uh, constituents in my area, in Argyll and Butte, uh, about half a dozen cases where we've moved them to Erskine because they do need that care and they get that feeling of comradeship and this feeling of veterans, and I, I know the Minister will agree with me, it is something very special that we enjoy, and veterans on this side of the House also know that too. Um, <clears throat> now, they also built 50 veterans' cottages in the last few years within the old hospital grounds at Erskine to house ex-service members and their families. And this gives the independence so much needed. As you know, as we get older, we still like and value our independence. And this is what we've, the, the Erskine team have allowed to happen. There is sport there, support there if they need it, uh, but equally they stand back and allow them to live their own lives, which is very important. As I mentioned before, the charity no longer is ju just has a presence in Erskine itself, but has centres right across Scotland, including the Erskine Edinburgh Home, which opened in 2001 in Gilmerton and has a capacity of eight for 88 residents. And there's also the Erskine Glasgow Home, based in Annisland, which has a space for 46 residents and was opened in 2007. Erskine also enjoys the partnership arrangements which have in place with care homes in Aberdeen, Dundee, Inverness, meaning that veterans across the country uh, can receive their support while remaining in their local communities, and this is terribly, terribly important. Erskine, I believe, has a connection now in every region of Scotland, so I would encourage members, no matter where in Scotland they represent, to get in touch and find out how they can help Erskine's work. And to sum up, I will use Erskine's own words from their own website, it says that our service personnel display the highest levels of bravery and courage throughout the world, and it's only right that Erskine is there for them should they need support in the future. I believe this sums up brilliantly why I'm so thankful Erskine exists, and so I thank them for the past 100 years of service um, to our veterans and to their families, and I wish them very well for the next 100 years. May I now formally move the motion? Thank you. I call on Claire Hockey to be followed by Morris Golden. Uh, around about four minutes, please, Ms Hockey. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, I would like to thank uh, Morris Corey for bringing forward this debate and giving members the opportunity to congratulate Erskine on the anniversary of its foundation and to commend the fantastic work that has been done over the past century. The First World War saw battlefield carnage on an unprecedented scale. At recent remembrance ceremonies, we rightly commemorate those who served in that war and never returned. The figures of local war dead we are reminded of are, are horrific to contemplate. 13,740 from Glasgow, 5,281 from Edinburgh, 
2,200 from Perth and 1,448 from Dumfries. However, in addition to those who fell, thousands returned from the front lines, maimed and broken men. The First World War brought injuries and medical conditions which had been largely unknown in civilian life, bringing significant challenges to doctors and nurses at the time. There were no antibiotics to treat injuries, contaminated with polluted mud of the trenches, and disinfectants were crude and sparsely available. Nursing at this time was exhausting, sometimes dangerous work and often at the very edge of medical science. Nurses serving near the front were also susceptible to infections and disease, as well as mental health issues relating to the trauma they witnessed. Radical solutions to extreme injuries emerged through sheer necessity. And as a dramatic example, medics experimented with direct blood transfusions, effected by simply linking patient and donor. As hospitals struggled to keep up with the demands of soldiers and sailors returning from war with terrible injuries, many with missing limbs, it became apparent that there was a need for a large modern war hospital in Scotland. And whilst the building was secured in 1916, as it was being transformed into hospital, patients were admitted to Killeen Castle in Ayrshire. The first matron at Erskine, Agnes Carnochan, and do forgive me if I've mispronounced that, worked tirelessly during the transition period, spending six months travelling between the two sites. And during this time, she combined looking after patients, recruiting staff, advising the hospital committee on equipment and furniture, and liaising with the war office. When the hospital opened in October 1916, Agnes had a full staff ready to accommodate 200 patients and oversaw the care of over 3,000 by the end of the war. At that time, when the full contribution of nurses to the war effort often went unrecognised, she was awarded with the Royal Red Cross Second Class in recognition of her work and diligence. Erskine Hospital was set up specifically to treat those who suffered the loss of a limb and quickly staff found that they had to innovate and seek creative solutions to the difficulties faced by servicemen. A limb manufacturing and fitting service was established at Erskine Hospital, who formed a unique partnership with Clyde Shipbuilders, harnessing some of their best craftsmen, and eventually some of the patients were trained in the manufacture of limbs themselves. Erskine has always been about more than the physical treatment of injuries, though, and at a time when many professionals still believed shell shock was the result of physical injury to nerves, hospitals like Erskine promoted rehabilitation and therapeutic treatments. Teaching servicemen how to adapt to having an artificial limb and the trades and work they could undertake with one was as important as their provision of physical health care. The developments which were made by facilities like Erskine in those early days have changed the way that both the casualties of war and civilians have been treated around the world ever since. Now, whilst I'm sure we would all prefer that man's inhumanity to his fellow man had not brought about the need for such a facility, we can only be thankful that it was there for the traumatised servicemen and women who needed it then and since. And it continues to deliver a very high standard of nursing and social care to its residents. Erskine Hospital has now cared for over 85,000 veterans in Scotland and is still an innovative and pioneering charity. And I congratulate it on its 100th anniversary and wish the residents and staff well for the future. May I have Maurice Golden to be followed by Jamie Green. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And I apologise to members in advance for having to leave the debate shortly due to a prior commitment. I would like to commend Maurice Corrie for securing this member's debate and I congratulate Erskine on reaching this monumental milestone. 100 years ago this year, my great-grandfather, William Duncan, chose to enlist at the Albert Institute, which is now the McManus Galleries in Dundee. When he was asked his age, he replied, 16. The sergeant then told him to take a walk round the block and come back when he was 19. He duly did so, and this time, when he was asked his age, he replied, 19. A little over two years later, on the 30th of August, 1918, while fighting near Le Basset Canal in Belgium with the 42nd Gordon Highlanders, uh, he was injured uh, uh, and shot in the back. Following an operation in Paris, the bullet was removed from his back which incidentally we still keep to this day, and he was sent for convalescence to a Boyne in Aberdeenshire. There he received the very best food, care and attention to aid his recovery. 
My great-grandfather received the sort of care and support which Erskine has provided to over 85,000 veterans like him over the past 100 years. This outstanding dedication to our nation's veterans serves as a reminder to us all that honouring and supporting our veterans is an integral aspect of public life. This motion comes at a particularly relevant time of year when we remember those who sacrificed so much for our country. Honouring our war veterans serves as a reminder that freedom is not free and that veterans should hold a distinguished place in our society for their sacrifices. Wearing a poppy is part of this recognition. That is why I recently backed the Scottish and English football team's decision to wear remembrance poppies on their uniforms, despite the ridiculous ban imposed by FIFA. And while FIFA have already begun to take disciplinary action against both teams, I remain unwavering in my support for their decision. During this time of year, I am reminded that there is always more we can do to honour our veterans. Remembrance goes beyond simply wearing a poppy. It's about doing what we can to support the veterans living in our society today. This is where the work of Erskine has made a significant impact, providing housing and a range of medical services to thousands of veterans every year. Erskine offers unrivaled care and support. It is important to note that Erskine was founded on the tenants of selfless service. As highlighted in the motion, the initial services provided by Erskine were enabled by the generosity of Sir John Reid, who gifted his first residential house to the charity. It is this foundation of kindness and generosity that has evidently shaped the character and motivation of the charity. This past July, I was fortunate to attend the Erskine Centenary Summer Gala Day. The event was a great success. I enjoyed meeting the staff to hear more about their work and the, their needs as a charity. I look forward to working with the charity and exploring further opportunities going forward. In closing, I offer my full support to this motion and thank Erskine for their continued service to our nation's heroes. We move to the last of the open speeches, Jamie Green. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, may I take this opportunity to uh, congratulate uh, Morris Corey on bringing this debate to this chamber. It's a great pleasure to take part in it and also to uh, uh, welcome uh, those visitors uh, to the chamber today as well. Earlier this month, I had the great pleasure of attending a Armistice Day service uh, at the Erskine Home in Bishopton along with uh, Derek Mackay, MSP. Uh, we joined them as they uh, took part in a service outside in the, the garden uh, at the memorial stone uh, in, in the, the public area of the home. Uh, it was one of those uh, uh, fortunate days where the sun was shining. It was very cold and bitterly windy, but it, the sun was out and it was such a, a beautiful day to share that experience with them. Uh, we were joined there um, by uh, local uh, residents of that home and also their friends and family. And I have to say it was my first um, experience of taking part in an Armistice Day or Remembrance Day um, event since my election. And it was one of those unique opportunities where I had a chance to participate in the, the wreath lane process and, and, the, and just join them in that. But I think what struck me most was actually chatting to the residents of the home after the, the formal proceedings. And, um, uh, afterwards, I was sitting next to a chap called uh, Jack Mackay, and I hope Jack doesn't, uh, isn't too um, worried that I talk about uh, him in, in the chamber. He's 98 years of age, and he's from Paisley. He was in the Argyll and Sutherland uh, Highlanders Regiment, and he was really excited, not just about the, uh, the, the, the ceremony that we took part in, he was very excited about getting his dram afterwards. <laughs> and he absolutely insisted that I join him for a dram. I had to explain, I tried to explain my car. I hope you're not here today, Jack, because my car was outside. And I will admit that I didn't drink the whiskey that I had in my glass, but I, I pretended to as best I could. <laughs> uh, on the way out, however, the real uh, experience which struck me about that day the most was as I was walking back to my car, just pondering over what I'd, I'd taken part in and actually feeling the immense pride of being able to participate in, in, that, in that event, uh, I, I met another resident, Mr. Peter Knowles. Peter is 89 and is another a veteran, and he, uh, he, he had laid a wreath uh, just a few moments before. He was dressed in his finest tweed jacket and a pair of 
tartan trues that I would only aspire to. And uh, I bumped into him on my way back to the car, and he stopped me and said, young man, which was a, a great pleasure in itself, but uh, he said, young man, I, I want to tell you something. I want to share my, my story with you. And he did. And we stood there for 20, 25 minutes while he shared his life story. And uh, I have to say, I, 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 you know, there were, there were tears in my eyes. I walked back to my car and he said to me, let me tell you the greatest lesson that I can give you as an old man near, near in the end of his life. He said, life is all about people. And what I have here in, in this home uh, are the people around me. And, uh, you know, I, I, I struggled to, to keep it together, presiding officer, but I have to say that that memory has stuck, stuck with me. Over that weekend, I went to further events, a couple in Greenock, where the weather was less kind to us. It seemed like the heavens were, were weeping as well that, that, that day. But that whole weekend really struck me as to the importance that, that these events have to us, that we're not just commemorating, we're not just wearing poppies for the sake of it, but we actually remember our veterans. I should add, just as I'm short on time, that veterans aren't just people in their elder years. Ver veterans are young men and women as well who have served. I think it's very important that, that in this debate we acknowledge that veterans come in all shapes and sizes and ages, and that it's our duty as, as political parties and as parliamentarians to ensure that they're adequately looked after through health housing and also employment opportunities and I'd, I'd like to uh, you know see if we can work with the government on any opportunities to ensure that veterans are are helped in Scotland I'll, I'll close finally by just thanking uh, uh, my colleague for bringing this debate to the chairman it's a great privilege to be part of it I really hope I'll spend more time in the Erskine home meeting more residents and hearing more of their fantastic uh, inspiring stories over the course of my my next few years as, as an MSP in the West region so uh, thank you and I wish them very well we now move to the wind-up speech and I call Keith Brown around about seven minutes or so. Please, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And can I also commend uh, Maurice Corey on securing this debate and say that I wholeheartedly support the motion which he submitted. Uh, it's fitting, of course, that the Scottish Parliament pays formal tribute to all those staff and volunteers, many of whom are here today, for the excellent care they provide to veterans and their families. And as has just been said, it really is about people looking after people. That's a crucial uh, role that Erskine play. I'd also like to take the opportunity to congratulate Erskine on their 100th anniversary and commend them for their many, many achievements. Uh, I visited uh, Erskine on a number of occasions, both at Erskine and also in Edinburgh. Uh, in June, though, I was privileged to be able to attend Erskine's commemoration service at Glasgow Cathedral. It was an extremely moving uh, service. The deep personal attachment of residents to Erskine came across clearly. I remember one particular uh, testimony given by somebody, and I'll not mention the name, but I'm sure all the people that work at Erskine will know exactly who I'm talking about, who had been with the Scots Guards, uh, I think it was, in the Falklands, had a, a terrible experience afterwards in terms of both his... Um, his period after he'd left the forces and that of his family, young children, real problems with um, uh, homelessness uh, and getting gainful employment. And it really was, according to his uh, story, when he went to Erskine that he made a huge difference in his life and in fact is now a senior um, a employee at Erskine. But just to hear that story, there was barely uh, a dry eye in the cathedral uh, listening to the way that Erskine had played a part in transforming uh, that individual's life, and not only his life, but that of his family as well. Uh, I've also been very impressed by the links which Erskine have built up with local schools. School children speak with uh, affection uh, and respect about the value of Erskine and the contribution of veterans. And just as uh, Jamie Green was kind of pinioned and, and given the story of one particular veteran. Veterans like nothing better than to tell their stories. But it's really um, rewarding to see young children listening to those stories and taking on board uh, some of the experience. It's vital that we don't forget that experience. A number of men members have mentioned that Erskine's cared for 85,000 veterans. 85,000 since it opened its doors on the 10th of October 1916. And as has been mentioned, not least by Maurice Corey, the work that was carried out in developing prosthetic limbs led most famously to the Erskine limb. And we've heard about the industrial kind of background that there was uh, to that. Uh, by the end of World War I, 2,697 men had been fitted with artificial limbs designed and made using the skills, as we've heard, of the artisans from the Clyde shipyards. Uh, but Erskine have, of course, adapted with the times, moving from the Princess Louise Scottish Hospital to develop a, a superb network of modern care facilities at Bishopton, obviously Edinburgh and at Glasgow. And as I say, I've been um, uh, to 
those facilities many times and I've seen the first-hand care that's been provided. And of course, it's true to say as well that residents there have very diverse needs. Uh, today's uh, Erskine's oldest resident, Janet Enterkin, is a remarkable 103 years old. Uh, she is the wife of the late Thomas Enterkin, who served with the Highlanders, Seaforth, Gordons and Camerons. Uh, and also Lance Corporal Ernest uh, Bryan is Erskine's oldest veteran. I hope I pronounce his surname correctly. Ernest is 100 years old and served with the Royal Army Ordnance Corps in France. So even older than Jack Mackay, would you believe? Uh, 100 years old, uh, served in France during the Second World War. The average age is 83. There are seven uh, of those uh, under the age of 65, the youngest resident being 42, although, as again Jamie Green rightly says, veterans come substantially younger than that in many cases as well, and many of those have received support from Erskine. And it is a real pleasure to see uh, some of the uh, residents and employees uh, this evening here in the public gallery. Uh, for our part, the Scottish Government is very proud to work in partnership with Erskine. They've received over £30,000 from the Scottish Veterans Fund since it was established in 2008. That's helped to fund extended lunch club provision uh, for residents, uh, research into veterans' needs uh, and to other worthwhile projects. Uh, Erskine also, of course, works closely with the NHS and other local service providers so that residents receive the best possible care. One thing that always strikes me is the width of the corridors. Uh, very important uh, in a facility like that to have that kind of width. And I've had the experience of the companionship even unto the very game of bingo uh, being played in Erskine uh, in the past. And it is the atmosphere of the place, as has been mentioned by uh, one or two of who have contributed so far. Um, it's the atmosphere of the place and that feeling of um, comradeship which is so important. Uh, going uh, forward, the future, I think, is very bright uh, for Erskine. It's got a strong, committed team led by Steve Conway. I'll quickly mention, of course, he's an ex-Royal Marine. Uh, Erskine is uh, held in great affection by surrounding communities. Plans are underway for more independent and supported living accommodation. They're also planning to develop the camaraderie, which I spoke of, with the local community, with a new facility for veterans from the area to join in activities. So a huge amount is done by Erskines. I commend the speeches made by uh, Claire Hawhey and all the other members who have spoken, um, Morris Gold and, and also Jamie Green as well for the comments that they've made and also being able to demonstrate the level of support there is in the Parliament. I think, as it is with veterans' organisations generally, it's important to veterans' organisations like Erskine to know that they have the uh, consensual, unanimous support of everybody in this chamber for the work that they carry out. It's only right that they do because the people that have um, potentially sacrificed everything, they've given a huge deal uh, to all of us in the efforts that they've made in putting their life and limit risk. It's only right that we give the best possible care uh, to them. So I wish Erskine, as other members have done, every success in the next 100 years. They have an unmatched legacy. It's transformed the lives of so many people offering that sanctuary for veterans uh, and for their families. And I'm very confident that they'll continue to provide exceptional care for veterans well into the future. Thank you. I close this meeting.